Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Live with the Hagley Historian. I am Lucas Clawson, historian at Hagley Museum and Library. Coming to you as part of our Hagley from Home initiative, I'm uh, live on my front porch, my beautiful home here in Wilmington, Delaware, with my uh, production assistant, Elliot, here behind me. I've changed cats this week. Uh, Lucien, who has been production assistant the other weeks, wanted to give Elliot a shot, so uh, we'll see how Elliot does today and in, in his production assistant duties. So uh, thanks for joining in with me today. So our, pro our, our uh, topic today is DuPont in World War I. This is something that I came into a few years ago doing research for the centennial of World War I, that the uh, centennial was... Uh, 2014 to 2018 to commemorate uh, when World War One was going on. So a lot of folks have asked about what DuPont was doing, which was quite a lot, and we'll get into that in just a second. But this is what this all comes from. So I've developed it into a public talk that I've uh, gone out and about and given before, and so now I'm going to talk with you about it today. So all the research that uh, you'll see, everything that I'm talking about, come from things that are in Hagley's library or from our collections. So let's get into the show. The DuPont Company and World War I. So to help you understand DuPont, I'm going to uh, paint with a bit of a broad stroke and uh, give you a, a bigger history of the DuPont Company leading up to World War I. That way you can understand the company's position when World War I got rolling. So E.I. DuPont Dana Moore and Company the full name of the DuPont Company, was founded on the banks of the Brandywine in 1802, sent out their first production of refined saltpeter in 1803. The uh, first black powder that went out was in 1804. So don't forget that DuPont started as a black powder manufacturer, that uh, most people know DuPont as a chemical company, and uh, World War I helps propel them into that, and this is something we're going to be talking about today. But to, again, give you the run-up to World War I, the fact that it's an explosives company that started on the banks of the Brandywine is an important part here. So Hagley Museum and Library is where DuPont Company started. When you come and take the tour, you'll see some of the, the uh, you'll see what you see depicted here in this drawing and some of the things I'm going to talk about today. The DuPont Company made its name for selling black powder, not to the military, but explosive powders. So DuPont became a national business between 1820 and 1860 selling black powder to mining and construction industries. These were the, the two big things that used DuPont powder, and that's what helped get the DuPont company onto the national scene in the antebellum era. So think about what's going on between 1820 and 1860. The United States is moving west. We're building railroads. We're sending people out that way, doing a lot of mining. Railroads are coming in. Black powder is pretty important, not so much for blasting out rail beds, or it's important for that, but it's even more important for blasting out coal, which locomotives use. So this helps get DuPont onto the national scene during those years. So that by 1860, DuPont is not only nationwide, but international. DuPont had sales agencies in all of the continental United States by 1860. This means from the East Coast all the way out to California. Also had uh, agencies in Buenos Aires and Argentina, throughout South America, in West Africa, Singapore and Hong Kong, Australia by 1860, everywhere in the world except Europe. That Europe uh, had a lockdown by manufacturers in France, Prussia, and Great Britain, so DuPont never got a toehold in selling there. But they were selling around the world by this time, and it's mostly these explosive powders used for mining and construction. So in 1872, an important step in the company's progression is the creation of what's called the Gunpowder Trade Association. This is a, in response partially to the American Civil War and a bit of economic disruption that happened during that time. So Henry DuPont, who ran the company between 1850 and 1889, and then Lamont DuPont, which was his right-hand man, so to speak, came up with the idea of creating the Gunpowder Trade Association. So this pulled together the largest companies in the United States to divide up territories, to price fix, to absorb surplus powder from the Civil War that the government had been dumping on the market. So it was a pretty strong association of, of companies, and keep in mind that uh, in 1872,
Price fixing was legal, so these guys could get together and, and do all of this. How it played out in the long run is that by 1900, DuPont had either bought out everybody else in the Gunpowder Trade Association or bought a controlling interest in everyone else in the Gunpowder Trade Association. So by 1900, DuPont was the leading explosives and propellants manufacturer in the U.S. And another little bit to add into this is that in addition to DuPont making black powder, they had expanded over into nitroglycerin-based explosives and also nitrocellulose explosives, so smokeless powder. It's nitrocellulose, the really simple way that you make it is to partially dissolve cotton in nitric or sulfuric acid and then process it out from there. But this is the things that DuPont's doing. Again, they're primarily a, a propellants and explosives manufacturer, but they were the biggest game in town by 1900. So in 1902, this fellow, Pierre S. DuPont, and two of his cousins, T. Coleman DuPont and Alfred I. DuPont, engineered purchasing the DuPont company from the other DuPont family members who had had a controlling interest in that point, that there was a changing of the guard, so to speak, in DuPont family members who ran the company, that uh, this was a big thing because this helps shift the focus of the company a little bit. Uh, Pierre DuPont, uh, if you're familiar with Longwood Gardens, he's the one who started Longwood Gardens. He was uh, also briefly CEO of General Motors, so he's a guy that has a, a reach in a lot of different directions. But he was president of the DuPont Company from 1915 to 1919, so throughout most of World War I, he's the one who's in charge, but presides over a, a lot of changes going on. A really important thing that he pushes in is the experimental station, which is still in existence on the Brandywine. So this puts a research and development as something that the DuPont Company firmly gets involved in. So the idea of the experimental station is that it's, it starts off as a ballistics laboratory. So the photographs that you see at the uh, bottom there, the one on the uh, right, is of an underground artillery range that the DuPont Company set up. That way they could have complete uh, c uh, controlled conditions in uh, learning how to use new types of propellants, new types of projectiles. They also had full machine shops, chemical laboratories. The small photograph you see at the top is what the experimental station looked like around the time of World War I. But this is a pretty important place for DuPont because they use it to figure out new types of products, new processes. They also simultaneously set up a, a laboratory in New Jersey called the Eastern Laboratory to figure out production process problems. So if you've got a machine that just keeps breaking, you send it to the Eastern Laboratory. But if you want to figure out something new, you do it at the experimental station. So again, it starts as ballistics testing and then goes out into some other products that the DuPont Company found itself getting into. So one of the, the last really important things to bring up before we get into World War I is that uh, remember that DuPont Company, the DuPont Company was pretty much the only game in town by 1900. This brought them under the uh, crosshairs of Sherman antitrust legislation from 1907 to 1911. The U.S. government brought suit against the DuPont Company and the DuPont Company lost. They were considered as having a monopoly on propellants and explosives manufacturer in the United States. So as part of the settlement, they have to create the Atlas Company and the Hercules Company, uh, both of which were based in Wilmington, Delaware. So Atlas and Hercules come about in 1911-1912. So I uh, think about this as far as timeline. This is coming up just before the DuPont Company uh, got involved in, in World War I. So this is just before World War I gets rolling. So Atlas and Hercules are, are part of the antitrust settlement that DuPont got into with the U.S. government. So let's get into the Great War, as it was called. A great war as in size, not as in great as in it was fantastic. So this was considered the war to end all wars while it was going on and involved everybody around the world, but not the United States initially. Something important to, to think about, though, for a business, even a business like DuPont, is that uh, war doesn't necessarily guarantee you big profits. War is uncertainty. And some of the questions that companies like DuPont have to ask is, how long will a war last? These are things you don't know. Who's going to win? How will customers pay, especially if you're in a war-torn area? People want to order black powder, propellants, other types of things from you. How are they going to pay for, for what they're buying? because you've got to, in turn, pay your costs, pay your people. How can we get raw materials? 
So uh, in wartime situations, propellants and explosives are pretty important. Raw materials are often considered contraband of war, so you have to think about that in the bigger picture. And also, once we make things, how do we ship them? How do we ship finished products? That's a pretty important restriction because in many wars there are restrictions on where products can come and go, even the types of transportation used to move products. And also, will my physical plant be destroyed? What if the war comes to your shores and you lose your factory? So there's lots of things to think about, and in the concept of war as uncertainty for a business like DuPont, and this is something that they thought about throughout the entire 19th century in the run-up to the 20th, is that the company didn't make money off of the War of 1812, they didn't make money off the Civil War, they surely didn't make money off of the Spanish-American War in 1898. So... Once war gets going, these are some of the questions in the minds of DuPont company executives, and this dictates how they, in turn, deal with people who want some of their products. So the war gets going in the summer of 1914. By October 1914, Great Britain, France, and Russia all approached DuPont to purchase their products. So remember back to all the war is uncertainty, DuPont had a, a good sense of what it was going to take to ramp up to make all of the stuff that people were going to want, all of the explosives and propellants that countries were going to need for a war. And so the company realized this was going to be a big expansion program that was going to cost a lot of money. The way they approached their contracts with Britain, France, and Russia was front-loading. So they're going to pay more than the actual cost for making propellants and explosives. That way they can finance the expansion program that it's going to take to get up to speed to be able to make everything that's needed. So it's a pretty expensive way to do business, and the Allies weren't terribly happy with that type of arrangement, but they needed it. They realized that there wasn't enough capacity in Europe, especially because well, the war was quickly running through Belgium and France, that it could be right on their doorstep at any moment. So these are things that they were thinking about. So if we can get propellants and explosives manufactured in America, that could be better for us because then we're not having to worry about factories. But again, front-loading the contracts, that's how this all worked. The Allies themselves paid for paid more for explosives and propellants. That way they could finance the expansion program DuPont was going to have to go on to, to make it happen. So DuPont ended up becoming a major munitions supplier for the Allies. Between October 1914 and April 1917, the DuPont company produced 400 million pounds of smokeless powder. So this is what's used in rifles, artillery pieces, stuff like that. 27 million pounds of gun cotton, which is a, a type of plastic explosive used during that era. 50 million pounds of TNT, a high explosive which was used in artillery shells, uh, sea mines, those sorts of things. And also 2 million pounds of black powder. Black powder was still used as a bursting charge in certain types of shells, it's used in fuses, all sorts of military applications even through the 20th century. So uh, that's, you know, their mainstay thing back from 1802 is something that they're still producing and important for the Great War. This means that the DuPont Company, remember the plant expansion, that uh, DuPont had to open new factories, had to expand their production capacity to meet the demands of all the Allies. One of the biggest places was the Hopewell plant, near Petersburg, Virginia. This started off as, uh, to be specifically a TNT plant, but DuPont completely retooled the business so that all they were doing was making acids to fuel the uh, Carney's Point, New Jersey plant, which was the largest smokeless powder production facility for DuPont during that era. So all that Hopewell was doing was making one or two types of raw materials to go into other production facilities. But this meant they also had to uh, build communities, had to build all sorts of things to go with it. And we'll come back and touch on some of the, uh, the corollary stuff in just a little bit. But suffice to say for the moment, DuPont had a huge expansion going on just to serve the Allies from 1914 to 1917. Then the United States entered the Great War on April 6th, 1917, President Wilson asked Congress to declare a war on Germany and Austria-Hungary, which they gladly did. So this means that now the United States is involved in the war. This shifts the way companies like DuPont have to think about producing what they produce, because they know now the U.S. government's going to come to them and want contracts, because the U.S. military, neither the Army nor the Navy, had the capacity 
to produce everything they needed to supply themselves in a war. The U.S. government approached these guys, which were the board of directors for DuPont during the Great War, and there's Pierre DuPont, kind of a center-left, uh, who was then, again, president of the company in that period. They approached DuPont uh, in April 1917, pretty early on, about uh, being a prime contractor for the U.S. government for explosives and propellants. So remember back that in 1911-1912, DuPont had to spin off Atlas and Hercules and lost a major suit with the U.S. government over antitrust. So DuPont played hardball with the U.S. government going into this because they weren't too happy about the outcome. They also uh, knew that for the U.S. government to get what it needed, they were going to have to go on another expansion program, which was going to be pretty costly. So DuPont negotiated contracts such that the U.S. government didn't necessarily front load like Britain, France, and Russia did, but that the uh, U.S. government would supply the labor, or that they would help supply or the uh, the cost for uh, everything that they needed to build the plants. At DuPont, whenever they, they built plants for the U.S. government, the U.S. government would own the plants. They would supply many of the materials that were into it, some of the labor that went into the, the construction. But DuPont would operate them. So everybody working in these plants would be DuPont company employees. They would be run by DuPont company managers. A, a pretty strict way of laying everything out to, uh, to, to get uh, the, the contracts done to DuPont satisfaction. That way the, uh, they weren't footing the entire cost for the expansion program they are going to have to go on. The U.S. government wasn't happy about how this was all going, but negotiated with them anyway because they had to. Uh, DuPont, it took them from April 1917 to December 1917 to finalize all the contracts. And interestingly enough, one of the stipulations of the contracts were that DuPont had to share information with both Atlas and Hercules and sort of bring them back into the fold to help them come up to speed to be able to produce some of the products that the U.S. government needed for the war. So the DuPont company had to go on a further expansion program. So some of the existing plants, DuPont expanded. The Deepwater plant at Carney's Point in New Jersey was one of the main ones. As mentioned, it was the uh, largest producer of smokeless powder for the DuPont company at that point. They expanded this even further to further expand their production capacity. That way they could serve not only Britain and France, uh, Russia was pretty much out of the game, or would be quickly out of the game by the time the United States got involved or fully involved in the war, uh, but then also to serve American contracts as well. So they had to add on living facilities, they had to add on production facilities. But DuPont had to build new plants. One of the main ones was the old Hickory plant near Nashville, Tennessee. So this was one of the U.S. Ordnance Department plants. This is one of the ones that the government would own outright, uh, but the DuPont company would operate. It took a tremendous effort to get it rolling. So the photograph you see at the top are African-American workers who were breaking ground to put in this plant. A majority of that plant were built with local labor. So there were a lot of African-Americans who got pulled into the labor gangs to uh, work on this plant. The uh, photograph at bottom shows you just some of the employees there, that there were close to fifty to 60,000 employees at the height of this plant. And what you're seeing is just one section. You're seeing about a foot of a yard-long photograph showing payday at the plant in 1918. Um, so just a tremendous amount of people who were coming and going through there, but a lot of infrastructure that had to get added in order to operate a, a plant like this. With Old Hickory, you needed a place to put people. So uh, DuPont's, uh, one of the, the things that they were able to get into in a big way is using their engineering and construction department to build their own housing for employees. So small cities ended up going up around many of the plants, the, the one at Old Hickory, which is shown here in this photograph near Nashville, Tennessee, but then also plants in Virginia throughout the United States, uh, some of the main ones being... Uh, like at Hopewell, uh, near, uh, <clears throat> down near Richmond, Virginia. So new construction for all these houses. So the houses you're seeing in this photograph are ones that were built for, for families, that uh, DuPont came up with a standard pattern for building these houses, and some of them are still around. There's still some that are in existence down around Hopewell, Virginia, and then throughout the country. A majority of the houses they built were similar to these. This is another photograph from the old Hickory plant 
out in uh, Tennessee. So uh, thousands and thousands of people living in these places that the DuPont Company had to build thousands of houses to accommodate all the people who lived there. So this was all done by the DuPont construction and engineering departments to build this. In addition, they had to put in water service. They had to build roads, get electricity in. So it's quite the undertaking to, to build these plants. And a, another version of boarding houses, other small houses that the DuPont company built. So again, they, they did these off of a standard pattern that the company drafted up uh, standard plans for these houses, divide, or sent them out to all of their plants. So this is the sorts of things that were going to be built uh, around the country. You would see houses that looked similar, communities that looked similar in, in all of these places. So DuPont realized, too, that if you're going to expand your factories this much, you need to expand your workforce. So who do we get to work? Realizing a lot of men were being pulled into the military through the draft, a lot of them had volunteered. So you can get some men to stay as essential workers during the war. But the DuPont Company relied heavily on women to occupy some of the labor force, to be part of the labor force in their plants. So this is a photograph of some of the ladies who worked at the Brandywine Works, which is uh, Hagley. If you come to Hagley Museum and Library, that's what the DuPont Company called that plant during World War I as the Brandywine Works. So these are some of the ladies that got pulled in. They were fully integrated into the DuPont workforce. Some of them even rose to supervisory positions within the powder yards. So they worked directly with the explosives manufacturing machinery. They worked in the offices. They worked all over the company. So it's not like these women were just relegated to doing menial tasks or secretarial work, that they were fully integrated into DuPont's workforce. And that for some of the women who worked at the Brandywine Works, the uh, DuPont Company didn't build housing around Hagley for, during World War I, but uh, pulled from a, a lot of the people who lived here in Wilmington. So they would send a bus down the Rodney Square, which is uh, one of the main places here in Wilmington, to pick up these ladies, take them down to the Hagley Yard, into the Brandywine Works, work for the day. Then they would take them all back to Rodney Square and drop them off at the end of the workday. Another group of people that uh, DuPont brought into the workforce were African Americans. So this is another photograph from the Brandywine Works at Hagley showing African American women working, uh, doing uh, some uh, menial tasks around the powder yards, but they also were fully integrated into the workforce. That Some of these ladies worked in the powder yards making uh, some of the explosives, some of the propellants. Uh, one even became a foreman in a packing house at the uh, Hagley Yard. And uh, we have her oral history interview that's part of the oral history collection in the Hagley Library. But these experiences are well documented. Lots of photographs of these ladies, uh, their own oral history testimony, and lots of records on them uh, talking about their experiences in the workforce during World War I. So this is an unprecedented scale of uh, bringing new people in, but also thinking about new ways to get some of these ladies into the workforce. The uh, DuPont Company also did this at the Deepwater plant over in Carney's Point. So these are uh, some of the ladies taking time off to uh, swim in the Delaware River at Carney's Point in New Jersey. And uh, these ladies lived uh, mostly around the plant there at Carney's Point uh, or Wilmington and then went over the, uh, went over the river to, to work there. But this is a, a larger trend throughout the DuPont Company was to bring women into the workforce during this time. And a, a photograph I'm throwing in, uh, especially from my friend Andy Grant, who uh, works over at Fort Mott State Park. This is the women's baseball team for the uh, Deepwater plant at Kearney's Point. So I know uh, Andy likes to uh, get into historic baseball and uh, photographs of some of the historic baseball teams around. But this is the uh, baseball team from, uh, again, the, uh, the women's baseball team at the Kearney's Point plant, in, uh, or the Deepwater plant at Kearney's Point in New Jersey, the DuPont facility there. Another thing that the DuPont Company brings in in a big way during World War I is protection for the plants. So it, this works in a lot of different ways. So they need health care professionals, they need firefighters, all the sorts of people that you need in a community. So the DuPont ha Company had to expand their firefighting force in quite a big way. So uh, this is uh, the, one of the fire trucks at Hopewell, Virginia for the Hopewell plant. DuPont did this for every single one of their plants, so they had a similar firefighting force for Old Hickory, for the Carney's Point plant, all the plants across the United States. So they either had to hire 
a trained firefighter or firefighting force to come in, or they had to bring people in and train them on their own. But these are some of the people on the uh, DuPont company payroll during this time. It's not just people working for DuPont full-time who are working in the powder yards making explosives. So they're also uh, coming in as firefighters, you know, other auxiliary forces. One of the main ways to protect the powder yards during this era was through DuPont's police force. DuPont already had a police force. Uh, they had had one since around the uh, turn of the century, some places even a little before 1880s and 1890s. But they were uh, uniformed police officers who were around DuPont facilities. During World War I, they dressed them in standard military uniforms. The photograph you see here is from the Brandywine Works. So the house that you see in the background is the uh, Eleutherian, Eleutherian Mills House, which is the DuPont ancestral home built in 1802. During World War I, it was used as a barracks for the military police that were at Hagley. The uh, military police also camped now where E.I. DuPont's garden is located. So when you come take the tour of Hagley, there's a lovely garden there now. But during World War I, it would have been a tent city of uh, these guys, military police, who were there. Their job was to patrol the powder yards, inspect every vehicle going in, every vehicle going out, make sure that there was going to be no sabotage in the powder yards, taking care of any problem that would come up. So they worked as uh, emergency responders, if you will, but then also as a proper police force. Uh, if there was any accident in the powder yards, these guys were some of the first ones to show up and do something about it. That uh, In our oral history interviews, through the Hagley Library, there is a testimony of some of the guys who worked as a police force and what they experienced when they would respond to explosions and other accidents, some of which could be pretty devastating and, and, and gruesome. So these guys were there. But we do have their testimony about what they saw, what they experienced, how DuPont operated, how the police force operated during World War One. So again, this is at every major plant that, uh, that DuPont operated that they, they had a police force. So plant protection was a big thing. So remember back to the firefighting, the police force, public sanitation, all of that. DuPont had to incorporate that into these cities, incorporate it into their plants for World War One. So let's talk a few minutes about some of DuPont's wartime products. Their main thing during World War One were uh, nitrocellulose explosives, the main one being smokeless powder. So this is what's used in rifles, artillery pieces, any type of propellant that was, was smokeless powder by that point, and that's what DuPont made. Another one of their mainstays was trinitrotolulol, which is the chemical name for TNT. So I know some of the, the explosives and the chemical experts out there will say it's not, tri, not trinitrotolulol, it's trinitrotoluene. And so you're, chemically it's the same thing. The name that I'm using here is the name that the DuPont company used for TNT during that era, and the chemical names that the other people used during that era. So chemically, it's the same thing. Trinitrotolulol is the same thing as the uh, trinitrotoluene, which TNT is, is called now. But black powder stayed on the product list. Fulminate of mercury, to, uh, which is like what's on the head of a Strike Anywhere kitchen match. There's several applications for that in, in the military world. Picric acid, which is an ingredient for... Uh, or an, an essential product for making smokeless powder. Hand grenade detonators. DuPont got into not only manufacturing the explosive composition that went into them, but also the actual items themselves. The DuPont company made artillery detonators, fuses, artillery boosters, which are um, a type of low explosive that helped set off a high explosive. DuPont also made Stokes trench mortar rings. They, they called them rings. They're propellant charges. They look like donuts and also Liven's projector propellant charges. And the last two are pretty important because these are what were being made at Hagley in addition to black powder, that they made the Stokes mortar, the Stokes trench mortar propellant charges and the Liven's projector propellant charges. And the Liven's projector was a, a type of mortar bank that was used to deliver either uh, gas charges or some type of a, a low explosive or a, high expl a small high explosive charge. So these are some of the things that the DuPont company made during the war. And to get you into thinking about how much DuPont had to spin up for World War I, we'll give you a few numbers here. So the, just take smokeless powder, for example. In July 1914, their capacity was 1 million pounds per month. And all of the numbers here are, are a monthly 
tally, not a yearly tally. So DuPont in July 1914, when World War I started, they could produce company-wide a million pounds of smokeless powder per month. By April 1917, this is including all the ramp-up for the Allies, so Britain, France, and Russia, they could make 33 million pounds of smokeless powder per month. By November 1918, when the war ended, after the American contract started, 52 million pounds per month. Quite a big production increase for the Great War. With TNT, in July 1914, 660,000 pounds per month, up to 4 million pounds per month by April 1917, up to 6 million pounds per month by November 1918. And some things, like the uh, artillery detonators, artillery fuses, the boosters, they had no reason to make these before the war started. So you see, the numbers are zero in July 1914. But they, you, you can see how much they ramp up uh, based on these numbers. So this is with the detonators, they go from zero in 1914 to 500,000 units per month in April 1917 to 5,500,000 units per month in November 1918. And uh, something to point out about the grenade detonators, you see that that number is 15 million when the war started, that uh, DuPont actually repurposed one of, their pro one of their products. So some of these same detonators that they used to set off TNT charges, they were able to, to repurpose into hand grenade detonators. So uh, not only were they coming up with new products, but they were uh, finding ways to repurpose old ones to, uh, to work into a military application. So this is uh, one of the other things that DuPont has going on during the war. So remember back to TNT. One of the things that DuPont had to come up with in some cases were entirely new products. So the U.S. War Industries Board, which was responsible for dividing out how companies could purchase products, what products got allocated to what applications, that way companies weren't bidding against each other or people weren't making redundant products. You know, this is part of, of what they had going on, the War Industries Board had going on in, in 1917. So the Industries Board declared the chemical toluol, the main, the main chemicals in TNT, to go to the Army for artillery shells. So these were used in high explosive artillery shells. But the U.S. Navy needed a high explosive charge itself. So DuPont developed an alternative explosive with the chemical xylol. So it was called TNX, trinitroxylol, which they made for the U.S. Navy. So why was this such an important thing for the U.S. Navy and imperative for DuPont to get involved with? One of the main ways that TNX was used was for depth charges. So this was a brand new thing during World War I, submarines. The Allied navies and then the U.S. Navy had to figure out how do we destroy submarines, especially when we can't see them. So one of the main weapons to use against them was a depth charge. So this is a big can full of a high explosive that's set to it explode at a certain depth under the water, and so it, the shock wave will destroy submarines. It'll uh, knock people about, sometimes even blow the submarines apart. So this is an important weapon for everyone's arsenal. So the U.S. government, and especially the U.S. Navy, got DuPont to help them figure out this TNX explosive to, to be used in these depth charges, but also in the fusing, too. DuPont helped uh, figure out how to come up with uh, depth charge fuses during the war. But that's an important application of TNX. The other was for sea mines. The U.S. Navy made tens of thousands of sea mines also to help destroy submarines because one of the Navy's strategies for dealing with German submarines was to mine the entire North Sea. So between Britain and Norway, they put in a, a tremendous, uh, they called it the North Sea Barrage. So tens of thousands of these mines went into place to keep the submarines from getting out into the Atlantic. Uh, knowing that the U.S. Navy and other navies didn't have enough ships to sometimes take out a lot of these submarines or even go hunting for them. This was a strategy that they came up with. So most of these mines, early on they were filled with TNT, later they were filled with TNX. So this was an important explosive uh, compound, again, that DuPont helped come up with to uh, make sure the U.S. Navy could do its job during World War I. Now a question... I get asked pretty often, did DuPont make poison gas during World War I? We all know DuPont today as a chemical giant, and so uh, the logical assumption in some cases would be that, uh, well, of course DuPont made poison gas, but they did not. This 
was not something that the DuPont Company made during World War One. And to think about the chemistry that goes into poison gases, that's not the chemistry that DuPont did. All the chemical work that they were doing up to that point was based off of nitrocellulose, so it's a cellulose type of chemistry. And most of the poison gases during that time are, are made in an entirely different way. It's a completely different set of chemicals, and this is not something that DuPont got involved with or even had any interest getting involved with. But DuPont did work for the Army's Chemical Warfare Service. They didn't make gas, but they made pyrrolin eyepieces for respirators. Pyrrolin was a type of plastic that DuPont helped develop, and we'll come back to pyrrolin in, in just a few minutes. But their main contribution to the U.S. Army's Chemical Warfare Service was coming up with the, the eyepieces for American-made gas masks. Pyrrolin was a lot lighter than glass, and they found that it would resist some of the poison gases that were out there, even mustard gas, which was the, the most awful one at the time. And, and so they could safely and effectively use these as eyepieces on American gas masks. But this is the work that DuPont did for the U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Service during World War I. So if you see reference anywhere to DuPont working for the Chemical Warfare Service, that's what they did. They weren't making poison gas. DuPont later on, even in World War II, continued working for the Chemical Warfare Service, but coming up with anti-gas compounds, things that could go into filters for gas masks, helping come up with better compounds to make gas masks out of, things like that. And also uh, chemical uh, agents that would neutralize poison gases. But hopefully that will uh, settle the question for you of whether or not uh, DuPont made poison gas during World War I. So we come to the armistice in November 1918. The photograph you see here is DuPont uh, giving a farewell dinner for the uh, French military legation that uh, purchased explosives in the U.S. during the war. That uh, DuPont was happy to see the end of the war come because it ends a lot of the uncertainty, but it also means that the world can go back into its own economic alignment, that there are uh, a lot of economic problems attendant to a war, and once the war is over with and everything works itself out, DuPont can go back to doing the things that it did well, which is making explosives for the civilian market. So DuPont thanked all of the allies heartily, that uh, all the major European allies they worked with, they threw a farewell dinner for them in New York and other places. Uh, the DuPont Company also received recognition from the U.S. government. So this is DuPont's official um, certificate, if you will, from the U.S. Army uh, or from the War Department. And they also got similar ones from the Navy and the Department of the Army. But this is the one from the War Department thanking the DuPont Company for their work in the uh, Great War. Another interesting little tidbit to point out to you as well is that uh, this is a check for one dollar for a construction of the old Hickory plant. So part of the contract that DuPont worked out with the government is since DuPont wouldn't own the uh, factories that were built and, and that they operated during the war, that the government only pay them one dollar for the construction. So in some cases, like with Old Hickory, the uh, DuPont Engineering and Construction arm are the ones who built it. So they only got paid one dollar on top of exactly what it cost to build the plants. And this was called the cost plus one dollar contract. DuPont came up with this for plants they built for the American military during World War I and carried this over into World War II. But we do have the voucher in Hagley's collections. Again, this is the one from the War Department for the Old Hickory Plant showing that they were paid exactly $1 in profit for constructing the Old Hickory Plant out near Nashville, Tennessee. So here's what we think, again, broadly, you know, painting those broad strokes about the DuPont Company and why World War I is important. This is an era of rapid expansion and, yes, record profits and a whole lot of new products. So here you see Pierre DuPont and John J. Raskob. This uh, photograph was taken a lot later in life for both of them. But John J. Raskob is an important player in all of this. He, along with Pierre DuPont, knew that the war wasn't going to last forever. So after the DuPont company made all of this expansion, what do you do with the production capacity? So all of these plants that they've had to build, all of the extra capacity built into the plants that DuPont ran, what do you do with it when the war is over? Because you can't just shutter all of that. You can't, or you can just shutter it, but you're losing a lot of money, and there's no way you would ever sell 
these properties or the equipment in them for anything close to what you had to pay to build it or and acquire all of this stuff. So what do you do? John J. Raskob spearheaded the program in, beginning in 1915 to think about other things that DuPont could do with this construction or with this uh, production capacity. What, what do you do with all this stuff? So once the plants were built, so by 1915 this was done, everything that was coming in was, was profit at that point from the Allies, so they were able to plow some of this money back into thinking about what are they, what are they going to do with some of these uh, production capacities. So this is where they start moving into new products, and this is how you get to start thinking about the uh, DuPont company as you know it as a chemical and, and materials company. So one of the things that DuPont got involved in as a result of World War I were paints and varnishes. So by 1916, they had purchased the Harrison Brothers Company in Philadelphia, also bought into a couple of other patents for paints and varnishes. Out of this comes the DuPont Duco line, which uh, was in existence for most of the 20th century. So some of the same chemistry that uh, goes into making pigments and some of the binders for paints, or they could adapt a lot of the production capacity out of cellulose chemistry to do that. So the uh, Duco product line, paints, varnishes, things like that, are one of the things that DuPont got into as a result of World War I. So this is expanding the business past, in a big way, commercially and publicly past propellants and explosives into some, some new types of things. Another era, area that DuPont got into were, were plastics, plastic substitutes. So celluloid and pyrrolin. So remember back to the pyrrolin eyepieces that uh, the DuPont company bought into a couple of firms that were already working on this problem, developed the capacity themselves. So they were able to put pyrrolin to immediately, immediate wartime use for the Chemical Warfare Service for the uh, eyepieces for gas masks. But uh, some of the products that you see come out of this are things like nitrate film stock. So a fun fact, uh, a lot of you may be aware that nitrate film stock will burn uh, pretty easily, almost explode, and that's because it's made in the same way as nitrocellulose propellants and explosives. It's the same basic chemistry. That's why it's so volatile and so flammable. Also, uh, some of the things that come out of this are like the toilet sets that you see in the, uh, the 20s and 30s, uh, these type of ivory-looking plastics that are used in everything from jewelry to uh, picture frames, everything you can think of. A lot of these these products, DuPont is in, in, in the, uh, the lead with helping develop them and market them and throw them out there. And so uh, the little can you see at bottom right is uh, actually a cosmetics holder that whenever you open the thing up, there's a little powder puff inside uh, and, a, and a small mirror that's in the lid. But these are products that uh, DuPont started getting into as World War I progressed, but also in a big way after World War I ended in the 1920s and then into the 1930s. Another major product line that came out of World War I is Fabricoid, synthetic fabrics. So uh, car tops are uh, one of the big ways that these are used. Also uh, leather substitutes, uh, fabric leather substitutes for things like bus seats, all sorts of applications for this, but the automotive industry was one of the uh, big ones, in part because uh, during this time DuPont was buying into General Motors. So in the same time World War One's going on, DuPont started buying shares, wanted to figure out a way to get products out into the world, so General Motors ended up being a big purchaser of DuPont Fabricoids. So uh, this is another aspect of this that comes out of World War One. you know, thinking about some of these new products and processes and ways to think about all this. So, so Another way that you can use all of the production capacity was in Fabricoid. Another main thing that DuPont got into was synthetic dyes. This is not really related to cellulose in any way, nitrocellulose in any way, but it's an area, area that DuPont wanted to get into. And uh, part of the problem getting into World War I is that the Germans had a lockdown on many of the patents for synthetic dyes and also had a lockdown on many of the chemical formulas for it. So uh, DuPont, again, wanted into this because they foresaw that there would be a market for synthetic dyes, especially for synthetic fabrics, uh, which were on their way by that point, getting into silk substitutes and other substitutes that DuPont helped pioneer in the post-World War I world. But the Chambers Works at Kearney's Point, New Jersey, comes out of World War I. So this was a, a laboratory and dye production facility that ended up getting set up uh, during this time to, uh, to figure out some of these problems. 
1918, the Allied governments declared many of the German patents open, so uh, DuPont was able to swoop in and grab a few, along with uh, a few other American chemical companies. But after World War I was done, DuPont sent agents into Europe to uh, hire out a lot of people who worked for many of the uh, German chemical companies and hire out some of the research scientists. So the DuPont company became persona non grata in Germany and in some places in Europe during the 20s and 30s for uh, swinging in after World War I and hiring these people out to come back to the United States. So that a lot of these folks worked at Chambers Works. They had them at the experimental station in Wilmington and throughout the DuPont company. But a, a big way that they were able to help expand products. So this is part of what's getting the company notoriety, expanding their profits during this time. So it's not so much just World War I sales to the Allies alone that get DuPont record profits, but it's also these new products that DuPont get in, gets into as a result of the war that's bringing them record profits. So what I'm talking about is the period between 1915 and really 1930 that uh, DuPont is, is really making out well because of some of the things they came up with as a result of the war, some of the thinking that they got into during the war. But the story is not over here. The uh, last bit that I'll get into with you today, and another important long-term side effect of World War I, comes from this book, Merchants of Death, published in 1934, and the resultant Nye Committee hearings in the U.S. Senate. Merchants of Death was a uh, book published to be an expose of, of American manufacturers uh, for profiteering off of World War I. DuPont uh, plays pretty, a pretty prominent role in the book Merchants of Death, and it mobilized a lot of people in the U.S. to, uh, to look poorly upon many American businesses for their role in World War I. You know, DuPont uh, took a tremendous black eye because of Merchants of Death, but this is what spurred on U.S. Senator Gerald Nye of North Dakota to form his own committee, a Senate committee during this time, to see whether or not American companies did profiteer off of World War I. So DuPont got absolutely raked over the coals because of this initiative, that they, uh, leaders of the company, Pierre DuPont, not the least of which among them, ended up having to go in front of several Senate committee or several Senate hearings during the Nye Committee hearings, and thousands upon thousands of pages of testimony. So uh, all of the testimony from the Nye Committee hearings is part of what's available in Hagley's library, so if uh, you want to come plow through it, it's all there. It's uh, DuPont ended up getting exonerated in the end, that uh, DuPont, especially Pierre DuPont, was pretty upfront about whether or not the company made money off that war, and his uh, his take on it was that in the beginning it wasn't our war. So of course we were making money off of it, and we were making money in all these new ways that we were thinking to use these products, but we didn't make money off the American government, and furthermore we didn't go and provoke a war, that we're not part of a, any type of larger conspiracy. So DuPont was again exonerated, but this was a public relations nightmare because they and other companies got uh, completely drugged through the coals and uh, the, just torn apart in the press and other places during that time. So what is DuPont to do? What do they do about this problem? And where we're going to land today is this. One of my favorite objects in Hagley's collection, this is in the building I work in every day called the Soda House. Uh, this is the mural from the 1939 New York World's Fair that was in the uh, DuPont Pavilion. And why this is important and how this plays into World War I is that the Better Things for Better Living Through Chemistry slogan and the campaign to rehabilitate DuPont's public image is part of uh, what happens. It comes out of the Merchants of Death and my committee hearings, a growing sentiment on the public's part to dislike American business, that many leaders in DuPont realized that they were going to have to do something to rehabilitate their image. So the DuPont company hired New York ad firm BBD&O, and the uh, design firm Walter Dorwin Teague to help them come up with ways to uh, make them look better to the public, to say, look, you know, we're not out here provoking wars, that look at all the wonderful things that we're making, you know, that we, we played an important part in the war, but this is not primarily what we do. So they came up, uh, BBD&O helped come up with a Better Things for Better Living Through Chemistry campaign. So remember back to all the new products, so this is where the company shifts a lot of the public attention, is to on the chemical work that they're doing. So by 1939, you've got uh, products like neoprene, uh, nylon is on the verge of being debuted publicly in 1940. 
you've uh, got a lot of products, cellophane, uh, which were game changers for a lot of people. So the, the focus was on that. And so the, the, the character that you see in the middle of this mural, the uh, iconography of chemistry is a pretty, pretty important one here. Because this is showing you, it's showing you the laboratory guy that the initial copy off of this wasn't a, a god like you see here, a godlike figure, but a, a person working in a laboratory holding up a beaker, uh, wearing his goggles and the, the laboratory coat, you know, showing all the wonderful research and development that uh, DuPont's doing for the, the country. You know, but there's a, that this is a big advertising campaign and this is where it lands, is the 1939 New York World's Fair. This was the DuPont pushing hard to change the public image, to show people what a wonderful company they felt they were and all the great and wonderful things that they were doing for humans uh, during this time. So for better things for better living through chemistry. There's a lot of good stuff packed into this mural. And uh, please come by Hagley sometime and check it out. It's a, a pretty interesting thing. So I want to uh, take a second and uh, tell you about some resources that are available at Hagley. Uh, if you want to learn more about World War I and the company's role, I want to uh, bring your attention to a, a four-part podcast series we did back in 2018 called The Mill Race. Uh, this includes oral history testimony, other uh, sorts of uh, stuff from the Hagley Library. But uh, if you're looking for something to do during the quarantine, this is a fantastic thing to go and check out, The Mill Race Podcast. So um, there are uh, interviews that are in there, yours truly. I am also a part of... Uh, talking about the DuPont Company during this period, but it focuses on DuPont during World War I and some of the aftermath, even getting into the influenza epidemic in 1918. That the uh, Brandywine Valley Oral History Project is a, another resource available at Hagley. There were hundreds of oral history interviews done on uh, people who lived and worked in the powder yards here in Wilmington, Delaware, many of them involved in World War I. So there's lots of great oral history testimony of people who uh, were police guards, people who worked in the powder yards, even an African-American woman who was a uh, supervisor, I mentioned her earlier, uh, in one of the packing houses who later were, went on to be an elevator operator uh, in the uh, DuPont buildings in downtown Wilmington. So it's a fantastic resource. Uh, please check that out. Uh, another resource is our digital archives, the Hagley Digital Archives. And uh, a lot of the photographs that I showed you today are available in the digital archives, plus hundreds and hundreds of other ones of DuPont Company plants, people who worked in the DuPont factory during the war. All sorts of great stuff shows up in the Hagley digital archives. So please go and check that out for more information. And I will post links to these in the event page once we're done today. That way, if you want to get to them, or you can just uh, start off going to our website, Hagley.org, and uh, click on the research tab you see there, and it'll take you into the library's website. And from there, you can get to the digital archives, the uh, Brandywine Oral History Project interviews, and then also the Mill Race podcast. So I will take just a second if anyone has any questions they want to jump in on. You can uh, type them into the comments section, and I'll see if we can uh, pull those up here. And while I wait, uh, another shameless plug, if you want to know about uh, other things that are going on at Hagley, also uh, other bits of our Hagley from Home initiative, again, go to our website, www.hagley.org. Also, uh, hop over to our Facebook page, Hagley Museum and Library, so uh, all sorts of videos, other content is uh, posted there. Please go and check it out. Uh, also, my page, Lucas Clawson, Hagley Historian, you can uh, get to that from the Book of Faces, too. So please go check that out to see other things that we've got going on. Well, if anyone thinks of any questions that you want to ask about DuPont in World War I, uh, you can uh, post them on my Hagley Historian, uh, put them as questions on the uh, Hagley Historian event page, or otherwise, or uh, you can... Uh, send a question to us via email. It's askhagley, A-S-K-H-A-G-L-E-Y, at hagley.org. Uh, those come into our reference system, but we'll get uh, routed over to me if you want to get a, a question in there. But um, I will wrap things up for us today then. Thank you for joining. 
thank you for uh, coming by and, and participating in this. A quick shout out to my friend Emily and her students at the Schuylkill Valley Middle School. They have been using many of these videos for their educational programs during the quarantine and closed down some of the schools in Pennsylvania. So thank you all for watching and for participating in this. And everyone, uh, please go to Facebook pages, click like, share stuff that you see that uh, museums and libraries are doing. We need your help. We need for you to take in our content, write good things about us, show that you are out there. Uh, we're trying our best to get content out to you and uh, keep things rolling even when we can't physically be on the property. So uh, if you are thinking about becoming a member of a library or other humanities institution, please do so during this time because, again, we, we need all the help we can get during this during this time. Thank you all for tuning in today, and we'll see you next Friday, 10 a.m., for another Live with the Hagley Historian. Thanks again.